All right, tomorrow we have a huge day because we got Rod Rosenstein testifying on Capitol Hill. We have FBI Director Chris Wray testifying on Capitol Hill, all before the Judiciary Committee. Do you think I should bring the Jiffy Pop? Do they still make that? I'll get Hannity fly down. We'll sit there together. Come on, it'll be fun. We'll live tweet the whole deal. I always love to read your comments on Twitter. Well, most of the time, some of them are not so nice, but we like those too. It's a big country. You got to make your views heard. Just keep it respectful. Live. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. The president, fresh off a campaign rally in North Dakota, is pushing for a Supreme Court justice who can go the distance. We have a pick to come up. We have to pick a great one. We have to pick one that's going to be there for 40 years, 45 years. We have got team coverage tonight. Kevin Cork standing by in Fargo, where President Trump just finished up a wild rally. Trace Gallagher following the media's meltdown. But we begin with chief national correspondent Ed Henry with the political fallout of Justice Kennedy's retirement announcement. All right. And how nasty is this battle shaping up to be on the Hill? Tell you how nasty it's going to be. I mean, look, this uh, big uh, midterm election is already going to be the biggest of our lifetime, right? It's just got more consequential. First, it was if there's a blue wave, Nancy Pelosi wants to raise your taxes, blunt the economic momentum that led the Atlanta Fed to say today we're headed for 4.5% growth. Then it was, wait, no, it's bigger. If Democrats take the House, Maxine Waters is going to try to impeach the president. That's even bigger. Now it's, hold on, hang in the balance in November is locking down the Supreme Court into a conservative court, maybe for the next generation. I've spoken to some of the president's top advisors who want his nominee confirmed before November. They don't want this waiting. They say it's doable to name the pick in about two to three weeks, then hearings and votes by October. But make no mistake, Democrats are going to try literally everything to try and block this nominee, regardless of who it is. Listen to Chuck Schumer today and Mitch McConnell going at it. Our Republican colleagues in the Senate should follow the rule they set in 2016 not to consider a Supreme Court justice in an election year. Anything but that would be the absolute height of hypocrisy. It's imperative that the president's nominee be considered fairly and not subjected to personal attacks. Well, personal attacks. Think about the tactics we've seen employed just in the last week and a half against Homeland Security Secretary Nielsen, chasing her out of a restaurant, stalking her home. Sarah Sanders uh, not allowed to eat at that restaurant. Maxine Waters saying, don't let Trump advisors shop in department stores. All these tactics could be used against not just the potential nominee, but the senators weighing this on the Judiciary Committee. You think the Bork hearings were nasty? You've covered all of this. You think Clarence Thomas and the high-tech lynching was rough? Put on the seatbelt, Shannon, because this is going to be the resist movement meets the Supreme Court battle. Okay, no doubt about that. Now, Ed, Democrats say they want to follow what they're calling the McConnell precedent, mm -hmm. not allowing this to happen in an election year. How's that going to work out? Seems like it's going to be difficult. Highly unlikely it'll work because Republicans have some facts on their side. Yes, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell stalled President Obama's last Supreme Court pick, Merrick Garland, held it past the 2016 election, never got a vote, never even got a hearing. But what Democrats leave out uh, is that the McConnell precedent was really the Joe Biden precedent. As judiciary chairman, he argued there should not be SCOTUS picks in a presidential election year. He made that case in 1992. There was no actual nominee, but he said there shouldn't be uh, anybody uh, considered before the election. This is different now. Republicans say, because this is a midterm election year, not a presidential election year. And oh, by the way, do we mention that in August 2010, the Senate confirmed Barack Obama's very liberal pick now on the court, Elena Kagan, just a few months before the 2010 midterms. And Republicans have something else in their pocket, what you may call the Harry Reid precedent. It's looking more and more like Democrats are going to regret the fact that Reid as leader lowered the bar to 51 votes instead of 60 to muscle through Obama's nominees. McConnell warned in 2013 this would backfire. If you want to play games, set yet another precedent that you'll no doubt come to regret. Say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, you'll regret this, and you may regret it a lot sooner than you think. Now, very interesting today, Kevin DeLeon, a Democrat challenging Senator Dianne Feinstein, declared that during the Merrick Garland episode, Feinstein and other Democrats, quote, surrendered the judicial branch to Mitch McConnell. So this is not just going to be about animus against President Trump, which is obviously already fierce in the Democratic Party. This is a potential Democratic civil war where Feinstein, other mainstream Democrats, are going to face intense pressure to resist this nominee no matter what, Jenna. Okay, so everybody gets a, a precedent. McConnell, Biden, <laughs> will there be an Ed Henry precedent? And I what think will there's it have a to Shannon do with? Bream precedent. <laughs> 
incited <laughs> by Laura Ingram, which is that you did a fabulous job. Thank you very much. Great to have you with <laughs> us, Ed. Our next guest will play a pivotal role in the upcoming debate over Justice Kennedy's seat on the court, both as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and, well, he just happens to be on the short list himself. Senator Mike Lee, Republican from Utah, joins us tonight. Uh, great to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. Your reaction to this news, because you and I have been trying to figure this out. Uh, we talked about it last night, whether or not it was coming. Uh, what do you think? Look, he's been on the Supreme Court for 30 years. He saw an off-ramp, he saw an opportunity, and uh, he, he took it. He's given a lot of good service to this country. He's been a stalwart defender in many instances of federalism, of separation of powers, of freedom of religion. And I, I, I think this was a big decision, certainly a decision that portends a lot of interesting activity in the Senate. Yeah, so let's talk about that activity in the Senate. Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, of course, the top Democrat on judiciary, says this, there should be no consideration of a Supreme Court nominee until the American people have a chance to weigh in. Leader McConnell set that standard in 2016 when he denied Judge Garland a hearing for nearly a year, and the Senate should follow what she's calling the McConnell standard. Yeah, uh, two very important distinctions there. Uh, number one, that was a presidential election year. This isn't. Number two, we have the majority. They don't. That's the biggest single distinction. That's the one that matters. So they can wish that all they want, but they know that we're going to confirm whoever, whoever President Trump happens to nominate. Okay, speaking of that, there is a list of 25 your name happens to be on the list. This is what a couple of folks had to say today. One of your buddies in the Senate, first Senator Ted Cruz. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Mike Lee would be faithful to the Constitution and Bill of Rights, that he's not going to evolve and turn into a David Souter. He is going to honor his commitment. Then we have a, a tweet from your radio buddy, Glenn Beck, who says this, let me be the first to say justice at Senator Mike Lee. Hashtag SCOTUS. How does it feel to be on the list? Well, look, I'm honored to even be considered for that. This, of course, is the president's choice. This is going to be a decision that's up to him and not up to me. I'm honored to be considered. Would you say yes? I certainly would not say no if I offered that job. Now, your brother's on the list, too. He is. My brother is brilliant. He's a member of the Utah Supreme Court. He's served in that position for the last seven years. He's a textualist, originalist, and a brilliant scholar. Okay, so about both of you, because you're on the list, uh, the Civil and Human Rights Group uh, Coalition said this today. Um, um, these shortlisters have well-established records of bias against women, the LGBTQ community, people of color, immigrants, environmental protection, and access to health care. Uh, and some of your colleagues in the Senate saying you are absolutely, everybody on this list is a non-starter and they will not proceed with a vote. Well, that's interesting. For, first of all, that's news to me, the way they described us. Uh, it's news to me that they could even know that about each of the individuals on this list. It also reflects a certain bias against this president, that they're not willing to confirm anyone he might nominate. Again, they don't have the majority. We do. We are going to confirm President Trump's nominee. So what do you make of these statements? I think of uh, Senator Kamala Harris, obviously a Democrat, uh, somebody we think will be uh, in the running or potentially is interested in the running in 2020. She said flat out today, we will not allow these people to proceed. Is there any procedural or technical way in which Democrats could stop a vote? No. And in fact, they sowed the seeds for the destruction of the process by which they might have otherwise been able to do that. Remember when they exercised the nuclear option in November of 2013, and they set in motion the sequence of events that would result in a mere 51 votes being required for cloture on a confirmation process. So uh, this is absurd. That's not going to happen. Much as they might wish it to be otherwise, we are going to confirm President Trump's nominee. What did you hear from your Democratic colleagues today? They weren't pleased. Uh, they were not excited. Uh, just as there were many on the Republican side who looked forward to whatever is going to come in the next few months, I think there was a lot of displeasure on the other side. Uh, there were a lot of words uttered that I think we probably wouldn't want to utter uh, on Fox News. Unless we want to pay some serious fines, and we do not. Uh, Okay, so let's talk about this timeline because it looks like Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is saying you're aiming for something in September or by fall he is saying that this uh, individual, whomever he or she may end up being, uh, will be confirmed. Yes, I think that's right. And look, the Supreme Court, as you know, starts in October. I think we need to get this nominee confirmed by October. Uh, so I, I would like to see that happen by the end of September so that whoever this person is can be ready to go on the Supreme Court by this time the Supreme Court starts its new term this fall. Okay, well, there are two chances it could be a Justice Lee. So either way, we hope you'll stay in touch with us and we'll talk with you throughout the summer as this plays out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator.
Well, as the president whittles the list of 25 potential Supreme Court nominees, he will likely get advice from a member of his legal team who's argued many cases before the high court. Jay Sekulow joins us now on the phone. He's also chief counsel of the American Center for Law and Justice. Uh, Jay, great to have you with us. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks for having me. All right. First of all, let's talk about the impact and the imprint, the legacy of Justice Kennedy. You've argued many cases before him and uh, very successfully. Yeah, I've been actually 30 years since he served on the court in 1988. I've appeared before him for three decades. And I think we looked at it today, and I think about 80 percent of the time, uh, Justice Kennedy ruled in our favor. 20 percent of the time, uh, he did not. When he did not, he, he explained his position. And obviously, I would disagree with it, whether it was a dissent or sometimes in the majority. But he uh, certainly was the justice that has played a pivotal role on so many issues this term issues ranging uh, from national security to religious freedom to freedom of speech with the uh, decision on the crisis pregnancy centers yesterday and the case that's attached to that one. Uh, he's, he's been a stalwart on free speech, but the next justice that now will be selected by President Trump will play an unbelievably important role, uh, a critical role, uh, replacing what has been uh, Justice Kennedy's legacy as more of a swing justice. Well, let me ask you, Jay, uh, this president in a very short time has already got two opportunities now. Uh, the conservatives seem to be very happy with Justice Gorsuch. Uh, now he'll have another name and a face to fill in this role that will be vacated by Justice Kennedy July 31st. Uh, what kind of impact do you see this president having on the court long term? Well, you know, the lasting legacy of any president is their Supreme Court nominees. But in this particular case, we do have two this quickly and the potential for many more. That this could be the Supreme Court and will be the Supreme Court for generations. So uh, I think not only is this a significant selection, obviously replacing someone of uh, Justice Kennedy's role, but also the fact that this is a multi generational uh, appointment. The president said today, and I think rightly so, he's looking for somebody that could serve for 40 years. And you, you've got a, a great group of nominees. You just had on uh, Senator Lee, who would be fantastic. You've got people like Judge Kavanaugh, Judge Pryor, others. Uh, Judge Barrett out of the Seventh Circuit. There's just a whole list of uh, potential nominees that the president has on the list, all of which would, uh, I think, bode well for the country and the Constitution. Well, Jay, we don't have the best connection with you, so we're going to let you go. But we know you'll be a voice uh, that will be counseling the president through this process. Uh, you knowing many of the judges on this list and a lot of folks within the legal community. Thank you for your time tonight. Great to have Thanks, you. Thanks, Shannon. Bye-bye. All right, the president, speaking a short while ago in Fargo, North Dakota, unleashing a brand new salvo about replacing Justice Kennedy. All right, let's go straight to White House correspondent Kevin Cork in Fargo. They were fired up out there, Kev. Yeah, you better believe it, Shannon. 6,000 people packing the Shields Arena here in Fargo. By the way, there was another 6,000 that were turned away. Really quite incredible to see just this incredibly long line of red hats outside here in Fargo. No surprise, a long and raucous uh, address tonight by the president to the crowd. 71-minute speech of the president talking to the crowd, imploring them to support Senate candidate Kevin Kramer. And yeah, he slammed so-called liberal senator Heidi Heitkamp. Now, the president also, as expected, mentioned today's biggest news, the pending retirement of Justice Anthony Kennedy after 30 years on the bench. Justice Anthony Kennedy, a very special guy also, just announced a little while ago his retirement from the United States Supreme Court. Great man. And I'm very honored that he chose to do it during my term in office because he felt confident in me to make the right choice and carry on his great legacy. Of course, this all happening on a night that the president, uh, quite frankly, threw plenty of political punches. But maybe he saved his hardest hit, Shannon, for New York Congressman Joe Crowley, who you probably heard was upset last night in his primary by Justice Democrat Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. One of my biggest critics, a slovenly man named Joe Crowley, got his ass kicked. by a young woman who had a lot of energy. 
lot of energy, and the folks over at TYT certainly excited about that. Uh, by the way, no surprise, he also mentioned Maxine Waters. He had uh, a lot to say about her, Shannon. He called her now the uh, new face of the Democratic Party, and he mentioned very briefly that it would still be very good for the USA to get along with Russia and talked about perhaps a pending summit, which we are, of course, awaiting an official announcement that uh, he may be soon meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. A busy night and an exciting yeah. one inside Fargo, North Dakota. Back to you. Always get the sense that the president really loves campaigning, probably more than just about anything else he gets a chance to do when he's out on the road. No uh, it seems like he would it. like to stay in campaign mode. Uh, and the feeling seemed to be mutual with the crowd there tonight as well. Kevin. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. All right, stay with us. More on Justice Kennedy's retirement. Trace is here to tell us why some Democrats say they're now in panic mode. Listen to a bit of this reaction. Justice Anthony Kennedy has just announced that he's retiring. Oh, oh, oh my God. All right, will the open seat be filled before the midterms? Will it drive the right or the left to the ballot box? We'll be joined by Pastor Robert Jeffress, said the First Baptist Church of Dallas. How are evangelicals feeling? He joins us live next. The Democrats acknowledge they don't have many options, if any, when it comes to blocking a vote on a new Supreme Court justice before the midterms. But that's not what some partisan media commentators want to hear. There appears to be a meltdown happening on air, on Capitol Hill, on social media, and within the DNC. Trace Gallagher is tracking the backlash for us late tonight. Hey, Trace. Hey, Shannon, as expected, reaction from the left to Justice Kennedy's retirement announcement was fast, prevalent, and pessimistic, to say the least. Now, we don't have time for all of it, but here's a sampling that tends to make the point, beginning with our cable news competitors. Watch. Roe v. Wade is doomed. It is gone because Donald Trump won the election and because and he's going to have the, the chance place. and because he's going to have the chance to appoint two Supreme Court justices. If he gets replaced by a hardline social conservative, it is the Democratic leadership will have hell to pay. They cannot let this happen. They have to play hardball. And now for a little fly on the wall reaction. During the Kennedy announcement, the Democratic National Committee was holding a meeting and a Politico reporter tweeted audio of their response. Listen closely. Then little-known left-wing comedian Curtis Cook certainly bumped up his name recognition today when he tweeted this line, quoting, I wish this Kennedy had been shot instead of the other ones. You got to assume his act is just a laugh riot. Then there were the real celebrity tweets. John Cheadle quoting, writing this, okay, Dems, this is real. All y'all paying attention, this is how you lose a country. All of our rights are in the balance. Urge your leadership to resist when Trump attempts to appoint the next swamp thing out of the Pez dispenser or kiss it bye-bye. And Cher saying this, quote, Supreme Court now completely right-wing. Trump's Supreme Court will take away our rights, Roe v. Wade, gay rights, too many to list. This blow could not be more severe. If we don't fight like our lives depend on it, some Americans could find themselves in internment camps. Liberal, liberal activists and journalists also weighed in. Al Sharpton tweeting, quote, we have no choice but to organize, strategize, vote, and act. Ambivalent attitude are not an option. All civil and human rights are at stake. What side are you on? And it turns out the justice editor at Think Progress is a man of few words, tweeting, quote, blank you, Justice Kennedy. Finally, Bernie Sanders weighed in. Watch. Trump nominate somebody who wants to undo uh, that constitutional right that women now have. You're going to see a massive uprising on the part of people all over this country, not just women, but men who think that that decision should be left to women and not to the government. We could go on and on, but you kind of get the theme here. Shannon. So we do. Trace Gallagher, thank you very much. Sure. Well, according to 2016 Fox exit polling, some 90, or excuse me, 70 percent of voters said that Supreme Court appointments were either an important or the most important factor for them. 
Senator McConnell's decision to keep the seat of late Justice Antonin Scalia open for nearly a year appeared to be a big factor in driving voters to the polls. Now, polls continue to show Republicans lagging this year on the generic congressional ballot. So will Justice Kennedy's retirement flip things for the fall? Let's bring in Pastor Robert Jeffress, a Fox News contributor. Pastor, good to see you tonight. Thanks, Shannon. All right, you heard in that last uh, report from Trace that there was a lot of talk about how this could impact Roe v. Wade and other big decisions. Justice Kennedy had been friendly to abortion rights. I want to play a little something we heard tonight from Cecile Richards, uh, who just stepped down as president of Planned Parenthood. This is definitely the break the glass moment, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess what, I, what I'm hearing, and definitely in the last few hours, is that women already are. Uh, this is really lit, throwing kerosene on a fire that's already burning among women in America. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to have enormous uh, imp implications for the, the midterm elections. Now, I want to contrast that with something that Leonard Leo of the Federalist Society, who has been a key voice in guiding the president on these elections, uh, what he has to say about that. The left has been using the Roe v. Wade scare tactics since 1982, when Sandra O'Connor was nominated. And over 30 years later, nothing's happened to Roe v. Wade. What do you think, Pastor? Well, I think eventually a conservative court will either overturn Roe v. Wade or at least greatly uh, diminish its importance and its power. And here's why, Shannon. You know, in 1857, the Dred Scott decision said African Americans were nothing but property to be bought and sold. And thankfully, that was overturned. Well, Roe v. Wade is really the Dred Scott decision of the 20th century. It said children in the womb were not people. They were just biological blobs with no rights. I think you're going to see that overturned. And this is what a conservative court does. In a liberal court, the liberal court creates imaginary rights for some people while erasing real rights of other people. There is no right to abortion in the Constitution, but there is a right to life. And I think a conservative court eventually will see that. Well, you know that you're going to give a lot of people hives tonight saying stuff like that. Um, Cecile Richards also talked about the fact that um, she believes the president has a litmus test on whether someone is willing to overturn Roe v. Wade or, or whether they have a pro-life record. Uh, how tough yeah. do you think it's going to be to get someone like that through the Senate? We're not just talking about Democrat votes, but Republicans, too, who would be resistant to somebody they thought might do that. Well, I think it would be tough for anyone except for Donald J. Trump. He has the guts to push forward in this. And look, I've talked to the president not long ago. He's a smart guy. He knows the number one reason evangelicals voted for him in the largest margin in history was because of his commitment to a conservative judiciary. And we also talked about that the reason evangelicals continue to support him at a 75% approval rate is because he's fulfilling those promises, not just at the... Uh, Supreme Court level, but at the federal court level as well. And Shannon, I've spent this year saying, I believe President Trump is the most consequential president since Ronald Reagan. But I'm changing that tonight. I believe he will be seen as the most consequential president since Abraham Lincoln. This remaking the judiciary is going to shift the direction of our country dramatically. It's going to cement his legacy as a conservative, and I believe it will ensure his reelection in 2020. Well, depending on which end of the spectrum you're at, you love or hate that analysis uh, about the long-term impact he's going to have potentially through the courts, as you said, from the bottom up. Uh, now, how do you respond to those who, uh, you, you cite the evangelical approval ratings for him. How do you respond to those who say, listen, these evangelicals seem like they're willing to put up with anything, vulgar talk, uh, suggestions of going after your opponents, um, making fun of people, calling them names, uh, making friends with dictators. Uh, they're willing to do any of that to get their agenda accomplished. And they, they say that you're a sellout. Well, uh, they've been saying that for a long time. But look, the reason that we elected this president was because of his policies, not necessarily because of personal piety. And is anybody really going to make the argument that, sh uh, that Hillary Clinton was a more moral character than Donald Trump? Of course not. That is ludicrous. We support this president's conservative positions. And what is happening right now vindicates our decision to choose Donald Trump as president. And I believe the Never Trump movement, the a little sliver of it, still in evangelicalism, is going to be shut up forever. Well, do you think evangelicals turn out this fall? There's always a lag, a, a lack of energy in the midterms for the president who's in the White House, for his party. Uh, do you think they'll wake up and show up? 
I, I think now they will. I think they see what is stake, and I would at stake, and I would really encourage the president and Mitch McConnell to push forward in this, get this done before the midterm elections. This will guarantee a huge turnout by conservatives and especially evangelicals. All right, Pastor, uh, good to see you tonight, sir. Uh, we will see if your prediction comes true. Come back soon. Thanks so much, Shannon. All right, other big news coming out of the Supreme Court today. Huge, a major blow to public sector labor unions. We're going to tell you what it means. It would have been our headline without this retirement. The lead plaintiff in the case who made history today, Mark Janice, is here with us live. And Catherine Herridge will join us. She was on Capitol Hill for today's closed door meeting with Peter Strzok and has brand new developments tonight. In what would have been the top story from the Supreme Court today, a 5-4 decision, the justice is ruling against public sector unions in the case of an Illinois state government employee, Mark Janus. He didn't want to be forced to pay union fees to an organization whose political messages he may or may not support. It's a decision that could impact millions of public sector employees just like him. Mark Janus and his attorney, Jacob Huber, join us now at a Fox News at Night exclusive. Welcome back, gentlemen. Good to see you. you. Good to see you. Mark, how do you feel? Has it sunk in? You took on this fight. It takes years to get through this process and uh, a win today for you at the Supreme Court. It, it's starting to. It's, it's a bit overwhelming, um, you know, to have a, a decision, you know, such as we received today. Um, is just so fantastic for public sector workers, you know, such as myself in 22 different states. And the, the fact that they now have a choice. They, they have a choice to make their own decisions instead of having something like this forced upon them, such as these agency fees and dues. Mm -hmm. All right, Justice Alito writing for the 5-4 majority said this, this procedure violates the First Amendment and cannot continue this collecting of the union uh, fees. Neither an agency fee nor any other payment to the union may be deducted from a non-member's wages, nor may any other attempt be made to collect such a payment unless the employee affirmatively consents to pay Jacob, they, I mean, they went as far as to say, like, it's not an opt-out situation now. Employees have to opt in if they want to be involved and pay money to the union. Right. That's huge. In some states, like California, people who take certain government jobs are just automatically in the union unless they figure out the fact that they can quit and figure out how to quit. Now it's not going to work that way. Now you're only in the union and only paying those union dues if you specifically choose to do that. Okay, now you know uh, the left was upset. Let's start, first of all, with the left side of the bench. Justice Kagan in her dissent said this, the decision will have large scale consequences. Public employee unions will lose a secure source of financial support. She went on later to say the majority has chosen the winners by turning the First Amendment into a sword and using it against workaday economic and regulatory policy. Mark, for you, this was all about the First Amendment and whether or not you could be forced to use your money to subsidize someone else's political message. Exactly, because the First Amendment gives me that right of free association. And unfortunately, with the forced fees that I had to pay, I didn't have that freedom of association. I was told what I had to do in order to work for the government. And if I didn't pay, I didn't have a job. Well, in the DNC reacting this way, they say attacking unions is one of the most powerful tactics in the Republican playbook to enrich their wealthy friends at the expense of working people. In fact, Republicans are so determined to undermine workers that they held a Supreme Court seat hostage for nearly a year in order to nominate an aggressively anti-union justice. Make no mistake, the nomination of Neil Gorsuch was first and foremost about winning the Janus case and taking rights away from workers. Jacob, how do you respond to that? Uh I don't think that was the only factor at play there, but uh, it's strange to say that this case is about billionaires when the plaintiff in this case is a man, uh, Mark Janus, who is not a billionaire. And what we've had in this country are, is a scheme where unions have been taking money from workers like Mark to enrich themselves. And we're just saying those workers should have a choice. And if they want to support a union, that's great. But if they don't, they should have the option not to. We're restoring fairness here. Unions have had an unfair advantage where they've been able to take money from people who don't want to pay it, which nobody else in politics can do. This just creates a situation where, like everybody else, they have to get by on money that people will give them voluntarily. Mark, what was it that made you feel like you wanted to step up on this issue uh, and, and not be forced to channel your money without your choice? Well, I, I was seeing the, the politics that the union was conducting in, in Illinois and elsewhere. Uh, I was also seeing the fact that, you know, my money was going to positions that I just did not agree with completely. And the fact that when, when I tried to get an accounting of where my money was going, it was 
just not available. It was nebulous. And yeah, they gave us some, some information, but it was so, so vague, you could almost interpret it any way you wanted to. And so therefore, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, why am I supporting this? And why am I being forced to support something that, that I just don't agree with? And, and that goes to the point of, you know, uh, not only policy, but we're also looking at the collective bargaining process itself and the, the lack of transparency in that whole process. Well, this case overturns a 40 plus year old uh, Supreme Court precedent that's been relied on for, for unions uh, for four decades now. Uh, so because of you guys, history has been changed. And again, would have been our top story. It's a huge case. Uh, but last we talked was before the retirement announcement and it's good to see you again after it. Thank good to see you. Thanks, good to see you. Thanks for having us. All right, when we return, our panel's here to look at the potential impact of Justice Kennedy's retirement on the midterms. Plus, that big upset in the New York congressional primary, a virtual unknown millennial self-described socialist takes down a powerful Democrat. So who's winning and who's losing? I felt like our party could be better, our message could be better, and that we could be better as a country. All right, the political and media elites are salivating over the prospects of the bases of both parties getting fired up in the midterms. Democrats hoping to harness the forces that propelled a socialist community organizer to victory last night over the number four Democrat in the House. Republicans looking to energize conservatives over a fall vote to replace Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court. Conservatives like Rush Limbaugh think this tilts in the president's favor. So let's review. Supreme Court has been clawing back freedom for the American people at breakneck speed. Close calls, but it doesn't matter. A win is a win at the court. Trump endorsed candidates winning on the Republican side. Bernie Sanders, socialist communists winning in key places on the Democrat side. Let's talk about it with tonight's panel. Fox News contributor Leslie Marshall and radio host on WMAL in DC, Larry O'Connor. And you're both in the same studio. Oh, Leslie, yeah, welcome. Know. We love oh, having yeah. you. Keep to yourself uh -oh. now. We've got bouncers standing by. Uh, we're pals, we're pals. Okay, so yes, you are. So let's talk about this win last night. This very young uh, upstart challenger in New York taking down the number four Democrat in the House. Um, she is a former Bernie Sanders organizer. Um, she is a socialist, or at least in part, describes herself that way. Uh, Larry, are the Democrats now going to embrace, th is this the wing of the party? I think they have to. I think it's Bernie Sanders' party. I mean, all we've gotten from the Democrats for the last year and a half is we oppose Trump. There haven't been any other ideas. And let's face it, 2016, uh, we like to think that the, the split was in the Republican Party over Donald Trump, right? But there was a major split in the Democratic Party between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. It was a very close primary. And uh, they never resolved that. They've never had to resolve that. And now you see the energy and the power and the victories. You mention uh, the young woman in New York. Let's not forget in Maryland, we had Ben Jealous, complete political novice, former president of the NAACP. He beat and came from behind in the polls. All the polls said he wasn't going to win. He's a Bernie Sanders guy. He endorsed Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders endorsed him. And he beat an establishment Democrat for the nomination for governor. This is who the Democrat Party is right now. I think it's the Democratic Socialist Party. Are you? Should we just call the party the no, Democratic Socialist? No, no. Leslie's not going to no. give you that. Embrace it, Leslie. No, no. Well, well, let me ask you, do you think that they are trending that way? Because we have have seen some races and in some of the primary races where they did have someone really far to the left that person didn't end up winning the primary which sets them up better for the fall a lot of people think okay. um, or is that split still there because listen when I was on the floor of the DNC the Bernie bros were not having it there was no kissing and making up with the Hillary Clinton wing at that point as a Democrat that's my concern is the split so I don't agree with you you got to look at this one in New York you got to look at the district this is a majority minority district mm -hmm. uh, this is also a woman with youth where some of the people when they say vote them out hashtag vote them out they don't just mean republicans oh, they, they mean they, they mean democrats as well and i mm -hmm. see i think we're seeing that in some but she also did have a message and she worked harder i think than uh, than her opponent quite frankly he didn't show up for a debate uh you know he didn't show i mean a what? lot of people out there she was a serious threat uh, i mean they was, she, obviously outspent right. her I, I saw one figure today that said 18 to 1 i'm not sure if that's right. Uh, right. correct so, but in, 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 so it, it's not always the money sometimes mm -hmm. it's just you know the the hard labor and the message that seems to be, and we're seeing this even in exit polls, is that 
voters are caring a lot more about health care mm -hmm. than Democrats didn't think they'd be talking about health care again. Certainly they care about jobs and they definitely care about immigration. So some of these social issues uh, we're seeing really matter in districts like this. And it reminded me of the upset a couple of years ago with Eric Cantor. Yeah, and that was mm -hmm. primarily, we think about immigration, it's certainly what it seemed to be at the time uh, where Eric Cantor was on that. Dave Bratt now, of course, holds the seat uh, running again this fall, like all of the houses. Now, let's talk about the impact potentially of Justice Kennedy, because mm -hmm. it, it sounds like Mitch McConnell, who does run the calendar in the Senate and represents the majority in the Senate, wants to get this done before the midterm elections and before the new Supreme Court term starts. So who does this uh, energize then to oh. get out and vote? Because if the seat is already locked down, what motivation does the far right have to get out there and uh, vote? Well, this is easy. First of all, Rush Limbaugh is right. Rush Limbaugh is always Rush Limbaugh is always it's right. Okay. And he was right about this, Shannon. He absolutely was. Listen, let's say in the 2016 election, we had an open seat. It was empty and it was up for grabs and Donald Trump won that. I just finished reading Selena Zito's great book, The Great Revolt, and she interviews all of these uh, voters in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, who voted for Barack Obama and one of the prime reasons they went for Donald Trump even though they were against him on a lot of the things was that seat they wanted to make sure that Donald I Trump could filled but it's not fit well because you need a Senate to uh, to approve that seat mm -hmm. right uh, whoever he nominates that, saying, so I think it's going to motivate that. those voters this is another reason to get voters out there and reaffirm their decision that President Trump is the man to fill that seat and they want to make sure that there's a strong Republican Senate to confirm him okay Ezra, Cl Ezra Klein says that yeah I think there's a good <laughs> chance Ezra Klein says this on Vox.com we're 133 days away from the 2018 election the path to a Senate majority for Democrats is narrow but given that they only need to pick Pick up two seats it's certainly plausible if democrats take back the senate they have the opportunity to wield the same power mitch mcconnell did over any future supreme court vacancies but only if democrats learn the lessons of 2014 and actually turn out to vote so even if the seat is filled we've got a lot of justices who are up in age and may think about retirement uh, they may not uh, but you have to be watching them and thinking about that. So will Democrats be thinking past Justice Kennedy uh, and that seat if there is somebody already locked in before the midterms and say, we can't allow this to happen again, and they show up? I hope so, because Ezra is 100% right. Um, but I do think this will motivate, I disagree, I think it's going to motivate Democrats, liberals, progressives, independents, people that just don't want a very conservative court, that don't want us to become a real-life version of uh, Orwell's 1984 combined with Handmaid's Tale. Oh, no. Um, and, oh, no. And, and, and that is a concern for some of us on the left. But, you know, in, all, in, all, serious, here, yeah, in all seriousness, Dem not just Democrats, but Republicans, too, They that is a function of the presidency that they really care care about and they know when it comes to confirmation you got to have a majority I saw tweets out today the Democrats got to block this and I, I tweeted know. they can't yeah. no they I can't don't. the only way they can block own. it right the only way the, the only way they can the only way they can block it is uh, to change the composite and obviously if, if if Senator McConnell wouldn't be a hypocrite and we keep to uh, what he said last time around let the people decide well, wait till we well, have the election yeah, that was specifically a presidential <laughs> election let's and you know oh that. I see well, oh, it's a couple, for his his words. He said there are a couple election. of Republicans too that you can't consider them a lock no based Susan on Collins the... has already said if she thinks yes. Roe v Wade is a threat that she won't vote for it. that's mm -hmm. the thing uh, that not every Republican is painted the same as you know they don't march in lockstep you know like you brainless Democrats no, do we don't. <laughs> Yeah, you just talked about the division in our party. That's true, but when it comes right. to the Supreme Court, you guys always seem to come through. And, and here's the thing: in West Virginia, with Joe Manchin, with Claire yeah. McCaskill right. in Missouri, this means something. If this, if, if you want to make this about Handmaid's Tale, that's going to oh, motivate right. we conservatives. We don't want to make anything about Handmaid's Tale. Uh, <laughs> Leslie and Larry, great to have you together. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We'll together. take this into the green room. Oh, yes, they will. All right. Political programming note: tomorrow night, Fox's Brett Baer and Martha McCallum are going to be live in Orlando, moderating a debate between the top two Republican candidates for. Florida governor. Be sure to tune in as Congressman Ron DeSantis and Adam Putnam go head to head 630 p.m. Eastern. When we return, anti-Trump FBI agent Peter Strzok goes to Capitol Hill to meet with lawmakers. Guess who else showed up? Catherine Herod. She tracked him down. She tells us what he said and what happens next. New tonight, the disgraced FBI agent who texted a vow to stop President Trump's election was grilled for hours on Capitol Hill by lawmakers. Judiciary Chairman Goodlatte saying late tonight, unfortunately, FBI counsel ordered Mr. Strzok not to answer many of the legitimate questions he was asked. We intend to hold a public hearing soon. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge tells us what she knows tonight. Catherine.
Shannon, throughout the day here on Capitol Hill, we've been getting a series of impromptu briefings from lawmakers as Agent Strzok's deposition progressed. Republicans remain convinced that Agent Strzok's anti-Trump bias infected the FBI investigations. Well, I would expect, uh, you know, any witness to suggest that they've looked at this impartially. I don't know how you read the text. I don't know how any reasonable person reads the text and would suggest that there was no bias. Agent Strzok arrived here on Capitol Hill much earlier today. He did not take Fox's questions or questions from any other reporter. Based on what we heard from lawmakers, they remained focused on these anti-Trump text messages he exchanged with FBI lawyer Lisa Page, especially one from August of 2016, where they talked about stopping Trump. Democrats said these were intimate personal messages, and at the end of the day, Agent Strzok was not the sole decision maker. There were, I think, 20 people, upwards of 20 people on the team. Um, certainly, if uh, one individual may display some political bias, the question is whether that would, um, you know, somehow uh, railroad 20 people into making a certain political conclusion, and I just didn't see it. FBI Director Christopher Wray and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who oversees the Russia special counsel case, will testify tomorrow publicly on Capitol Hill before the same House panel. Shannon? Catherine Herridge on the Hill, thank you very much. Stay with us. Our Midnight Hero is next.